we got something a little bit different for you today. This is going to be, from my experience, the number one opening mistake that occurs in tournament play in the United States. And I say this because dating back all the way to 2015, I assisted doing game analysis in Orlando grade level nationals for chess.com and analyzed hundreds of games that weekend. Saw the mistake there. Now fast forward through years of doing game analysis for different teams, organizations, etc. Now working full time for Chessable, I find myself at all of the nationals in the 2021 year. From December grade level nationals to fast forward 2022 where we've got high school, junior high, and elementary nationals. And time and time again, as I attended all these events, doing game analysis, analyzing hundreds of games, it became sickening how often I saw the mistake that we're about to go through. And let's dive right in. And as I am getting to it, I want to explain why I think this is happening. Because a lot of people start off with E4, best by test and all that. But for, for coaches and parents, they're just doing what's natural. They're not thinking that whoever has the most experience with this type of thing is going to have an advantage. I found from my personal experience as a coach, taking a team from peace movement to state champions in Florida in two years, we did not play the standard openings that almost all the books recommend. Start with classical games like Morphe. Well, as a classroom teacher, I learned that if you are teaching everyone to play the same, some kids are going to get really bored and hate it. And if I have to have them for 18 weeks, I want to make it as fun as possible. So I taught most of the students systematic structural openings and systems that worked on both sides. And some of those lines are even frowned upon by a lot of players, like the Nimzo Larson and Owens defense. But if you don't have to learn a lot of theory, you're not going to lose quickly. You can play a game of chess and enjoy it. So that was my philosophy with a lot of my students. And those who wanted to put in more work, I gave them the nasty stuff to work with, like E4. But do I think everyone's an E4 player and should start out with it? No, no, I do not. And you'll see why quickly here. As we see, number one thing in response in scholastic chess, E4, E5. No imbalances, pure symmetry, knight f3, knight c6, then we see bishop c4. And from this point, this is going to be another very frequently occurring mistake that I had analyzed. You see knight f6 followed by knight c3. An alarm bell should go off for those who are king pawn players on either side. This is actually an error as knight takes e4 gives white significant problems. And when you check the database, this tactical motif results in black winning nearly 70% of the games when the position's been reached. And of course, there's a number of different lines here, but the main point is d5. I'm getting my piece back, and I have very easy development. What more can you ask for? So on to the main event what I saw by far most frequently. Bishop c5, and then knight c3 anyway. This is it, this is the position. And some people are going, well, this isn't a mistake, what's wrong with that? Okay, this position has been reached almost 13,000 times in Chessbase Mega Database, or the Chessbase Online Database, rather. And when you look at the top game, you've even got Vladimir Kramnik playing it. So I no way claim to know as, as much as a lot of these top players who have played it, but I do find that when the top players are just wanting an equal game to play, they'll choose a variation like this, which is quite equal, to not worry about showing preparation, especially in rapid events. So there are reasons why top players will play something that is objectively not very good. When you get down to it, Black is doing better than white, statistically, after knight c3. So, let's continue a little bit. Knight f6, d3, d6, and at this point, most scholastic players will throw in both 
h3 and h6 without any thought, immediate moves. And a point of knowledge here, there are many variations where a bishop traveling to g5 or g4 could be a mistake. I have always had the rule myself, never interrupt your opponent when they're making a mistake. So I'm not going to go into intimate details of these things with because there's a lot of scenarios for when to allow bishop g5, for instance, and when not to, or bishops coming here. But I will say, you can find multiple chessable texts that cover e4, e5 games, especially with the Italian that I would suggest diving into. But say, for instance, as a quick preview, bishop g5 this early, it's not an issue to play h6, g5. Your king has not committed to the king side. So this is an idea that is so rarely seen in those scholastic games. And in fact, I made the recommendation to one young man who came to see me in elementary nationals. And uh, he came back, had the exact same game, castled queenside, and mauled his opponent who castled kingside as he was able to get over here, bring the rook over, and push pawns and rip open the king's side with an easy win. So, automatic moves, h3, h6, take a lot of the life out of the position. Then we keep going, castle, castle. And it's around this time that they run out of plans and they start making awkward moves and the better player ends up winning almost every game. Well, the best you can do is bishop e3. And we're really hoping here that black will take the time to take. Because if he does, now we've got an open f file, we've got an imbalance with the pawn structure, and we can play d4 at some point. That would be great. We could do something. But no, that's not going to happen. Bishop b6. And it's around this point that you go, well, what am I doing? Why? Uh, so I take, well, that developed Black's Rook on A8 for free. You go, okay, well, I got to do something, D4. And after this tactical combination, Black's got full equality. So what should you be doing? We definitely have seen that this position with Knight C3, this is... what I would really like to see players avoid. So why? Let's compare the way the game actually should be played. So we're gonna get to our topical position, and now here, C3. And when you check the online database, by far the main move with nearly 66,000 games. Now why is it so much better than the previous natural developing move? It's an imbalance. It creates an imbalance that black can't copy. Outplaying the opponent in chess is the accumulation of imbalances, small advantages, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Winning chess games stems from this. So let's keep going a bit and, and see why c3 is so much better. Knight of six. Well, hitting our e-pawn, d3, fair enough. d6, castles. Notice I'm not scared of bishop g4. I've held back on h3. And on castles. Bishop b3, most flexible move, as white may want to drop the bishop back to c2 in some variations where, say, bishop b6 is played. And here's a good example. Bishop g4, one of those times allowing is favorable. A good reason to not automatically play h3. I'll let the reader figure out why this wins, but it wins nearly 80% of the time for white in practice. Interesting, right? So after d3... Castle, castle, we get back to our position a6 instead. This is the most popular option for black. Now, here's the plan. This is the difference between that immediate knight c3. Well, I want to go rook e1, knight d2, knight f1, knight g3. Where with the knight on g3, he's supporting the e-pawn. We could look at potential d4. And we could also have the idea of knight h4, knight f5. And we'll see more with less arrows as we get deeper into the game. But first, after knight bd2, we need to play h3 before playing rook e1. Because if we play rook e1 immediately, 
we're going to run into knight g4. And we have to defend the f-pawn. So we actually have a legitimate reason for playing h3, a purpose, and that's why it's played now. So h6 and black, for the same reason, can't play rook e8. So he plays h6. He has an actual legitimate reason for doing so, not just because I've seen it done. Have reasons for the moves. Rook e1, and now rook e8. And we're going to be following a game between Sarna, Rapport, 2021. Knight f1, bishop e6, knight g3. And this is our topical position. And notice the difference in play. You can skim back to the video where we have just simply knight c3, and white eventually runs out of plans and moves with reasonable play by black. Here, we've got lots of play, lots of ideas. And black, in fact, went with d5 to create an imbalance. Bishop c2, knight h4, knight h to f5. And it's been reached many times in practice, but looking at that game between Sarna, Rapport is a good example game for how to play and it exemplifies an imbalanced position where white's got some slight pull, even though black is fully developed cleanly, and Sarna went on to win this game. So hopefully you found this video instructive, especially my scholastic players out there, because I recommended this video to you probably at an event to watch because you made this mistake. Please fix the mistake. You don't want this position because it limits your abilities. You want this position because you have flexibility with that plan. And keep in mind, it's rookie one, knight f1, knight g3. Once you see the pattern, you'll have much better games. So hopefully this was helpful for you. Thanks for joining in.